In this second video on capital structure, I'll discuss some of the main theories in the field of capital structure, and then I'll start to walk through some of the ratios that we use to calculate leverage, both operating leverage and financial leverage. And then finally, I'll discuss leverage and how it's used by firms around the world. Now, as you undoubtedly saw in part one of this capital structure lecture, an increase in leverage can often boost firm value. So the obvious question is, why don't all firms borrow as much as they can to increase firm value and shareholder value? Well, the reason is because beyond a certain point, borrowing can actually decrease firm value as a firm's credit rating falls and the cost of equity rises due to the risk of the firm not being able to pay back its creditors. This means that there should be some happy medium or some ideal capital structure that a firm should have. And there's many theories in finance that give us some indication what a firm's ideal capital structure should be. I'll discuss each of these in turn. Let's get started. Trade-off theory is one of the oldest theories in finance. It was developed as a result of a 1958 paper by Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller. As a side note, Modigliani actually won the Nobel Prize in economics for this paper. Uh, don't worry, Miller won the Nobel Prize for a later paper. Uh, now, the original paper implies that if there were no taxes, no transaction costs, and no bankruptcy costs, then firm value would be unaffected by increasing leverage. In other words, the original paper shows that there should be no benefit to adjusting your capital structure because what determines firm value is the cash flows of the firm. Now, obviously in the real world, we've already talked about the tax shield. The tax shield is the term for the reduction of taxes you get when you pay interest expenses. The reason I mention the tax shield here is because if we combine trade-off theory and the value of the tax shield, we can arrive at the conclusion that firm value increases by the total value of the tax shield. This means that the ideal capital structure is the one where the firm levers up as much as it possibly can to take advantage of the tax shield. That's the big takeaway of trade-off theory lever up. The next theory we have is pecking order theory. Pecking order theory implies that there should be a pecking order that determines how a firm raises new capital it invests. The reason for this is because internally generated cash has no cost, while issuing new securities comes with a cost. Therefore, a firm should use free cash flow it generates from operations to fund new capital budgeting projects. Then, once it runs out of internally generated cash, it should issue new debt or borrow from a bank because the yield to maturity on debt is lower than the return expected or demanded by shareholders. Finally, once a firm runs out of its ability to borrow, it should issue new shares of stock. So in other words, the pecking order of capital raising should go internally generated cash, debt, and then new stock. The next theory we have related to capital budgeting is agency theory. And agency theory is very broad, and it's used in a number of fields to explain human behavior. Agency theory involves a principal that owns some asset and an agent whom the principal hires to act on their behalf. There are all kinds of agency relationships in finance and management, but the classic example in finance is the agency relationship between shareholders and board members. Shareholders own the firm, but they often don't have time to oversee management themselves. So what they do is they appoint a board to oversee the firm and the management on their behalf. The problem with this is the same as the problem in every agency relationship. There's going to be what are called agency costs. And agency costs are the opportunity costs of not managing the operations yourself and instead hiring an agent whose incentives are not aligned with yours. In the case of shareholders hiring board members, the board members might not act in the best interests of the shareholders and, let's say, vote to increase their own salaries. They might also slack in their oversight roles. Therefore, shareholders need to find ways to incentivize board members to act appropriately and thus reduce agency costs. In a capital structure context, we tend to focus on the agency relationship between board members and management. The board would be the principal and the management would be the agent. The board appoints the management team to act appropriately, but sometimes management might buy a corporate jet. Why? Because they can. This kind of reckless spending on behalf of management is obviously detrimental to shareholders. 
So the board can often find ways to remove any extra cash from the hands of management. One of the best ways is to issue debt that comes with regular coupon payments. These coupon payments will force the management to be more careful with the cash it maintains on the balance sheet because it needs that cash to make payments to bondholders. The end result of agency theory is that it implies a firm will have at least some level of debt in order to incentivize management not to engage in any wasteful activities that damage shareholder value. Next, we have signaling theory. Like agency theory, signaling theory is used in contexts outside of capital structure. The theory indicates that if there's information asymmetry between two parties, the party with less information has to use new information it receives to make an informed opinion. This means that new information should send a signal to investors. In the case of capital structure, if a firm issues new equity rather than new debt, this should lead investors to question why the firm didn't issue new debt instead, because debt is cheaper to the firm to issue than equity is. The most likely answer for this is that firm management doesn't believe the firm will be able to make the coupon payments on any new debt issuances. Investors should take a, an issuance of equity as a negative signal, and typically we would expect that the share price of the firm would fall anytime the firm announces that it's going to issue new equity. The end result of signaling theory is that during normal times, a firm should maintain a reserve borrowing capacity that can be used in the event some good investment opportunities come along. This suggests that firms will not borrow as much as they otherwise could. The final theory that I have for us in this lecture is market timing. And Market timing suggests management will borrow when it's better to borrow and issue new stock when it's better to issue new stock. This means that firms will issue new debt when interest rates are low and issue new equity when interest rates are high or market liquidity is low. This theory implies that the ideal capital structure for a firm will change based on market conditions. Now, there's at least some empirical evidence to support this theory, as well as all of the other theories I just mentioned. Financial economists are still examining the factors that determine a firm's capital structure today, and there's no one theory that has more evidence to support it than any of the others I just mentioned. Now, let's switch gears and talk about the degree of leverage firms have. Leverage occurs when a firm has fixed costs associated either with its sales and production operations or the type of financing it, it uses. There are two broad types of leverage, operating leverage and financial leverage. We have measures of each and we can also measure total leverage. Let's start with the degree of operating leverage. The degree of operating leverage is the percentage change in operating income or EBIT as it's sometimes known associated with a given percentage change in sales. Our formula here indicates that a percentage change in net operating income divided by a percentage change in sales will give us our degree of operating leverage for, uh, calculation. If we wanted to rearrange that, what we could say is that the change in the value of the EBIT divided by the original value of the EBIT all divided by the change in the value of sales divided by the original value of sales will give us our degree of operating leverage. The degree of operating leverage indicates the percentage change in EBIT that results for a percentage change in sales. For example, a DOL of 2.5 would indicate that if there was a 1% change in sales, we would expect a 2.5% change in EBIT. Now, some of these numbers in this formula are not easily calculable unless we either have one of two things. Either we have historical financial statements that we can compare through time, or if we can if we can forecast EBIT and sales, then we can calculate the degree of operating leverage. Now, there are other formulas that we can use here to calculate DOL, but let's take a look at exam an example where we actually use this formula, and then we'll move on to some of those other formulas. All right. So in this example, the CFO of Tesla expects this year's sales to be 2.5 million. EBIT is expected to be 1 million, and the, CFA, the CFO knows that if sales actually turn out to be 2.3 million, Tesla's EBIT will be 880,000. What is Tesla's DOL? So here, this is a case where we could use the formula I just gave you. And we know our current year sales of 
2.5 million. We know our future sales of 2.3 million. We know our current EBIT of 1 million, and we know how EBIT will change if sales increase. So all we're going to do is we're going to use this first part of the formula. I, I swapped the original part here. I swapped these two parts. But basically what we're going to do is calculate first the change in the EBIT from present to future, divide by the present EBIT, and then divide all of that by the change in sales from present to future, and divide by present sales or current sales. And so what we get is something that looks like this. We take 880,000 for the future EBIT minus the current, subtract the, the current EBIT and divide all of that by the current EBIT. We divide that entire number by the future sales minus the current sales of 2.5 million and divide by 2.5 million and that gives us a DOL of 1.5. Here are two other formulas for calculating the degree of operating leverage. This first formula involves looking at the a little more uh, microeconomic information. So if we know, let's say, the quantity of goods that a firm is producing, and we know the price per unit and the variable and fixed costs of those goods, what we can actually do is we can calculate the degree of operating leverage by taking the quantity multiplied by the price minus the variable cost of each unit and dividing that by quantity of units produced multiplied by price minus variable cost and then subtract this entire portion by the fixed costs and that's going to give us our degree of operating leverage at the same time we can also if we wanted to rearrange this formula what we could do is take the uh, initial sales in dollar terms and divide by the total variable costs in terms of dollars and divide that by sales minus variable costs, minus fixed costs, and that'll give us our degree of operating leverage. There's also a formula out there for degree of operating leverage uh, where all we do is just take our gross profit and divide by our EBIT, and that'll give us our DOL. All right, let's take a, a look at another example. So your firm currently produces 10,000 textbooks for $45 a unit. You sell each book for $60 a book. You pay $3,000 a month to rent the workspace where you produce these books. What is your degree of operating leverage? Well, here we know our inputs. We know that the cost to produce a book is $45, so that's our V in this equation, or this problem. We know our price that we're selling each book for is $60. We know that our fixed costs are $3,000 because that's what we're renting, and we have to pay that regardless. And finally, we know that we produce $10,000 books and we'll assume that we sell all of those books. So our DOL is just going to be calculated by plugging all of these variables into the formula and we get something like this. 10,000 multiplied by our difference, basically our, our our unit margin and then we divide all of that by our quantity times our margin that we earn on each book and subtract out the fixed cost of 3,000 and that gives us our DOL of 1.25. The next measure of leverage we have is the degree of financial leverage. The degree of financial leverage is the percentage change in earnings per share, or EPS, associated with a given percentage change in earnings before interest and taxes, aka EBIT. All right, so in this formula, all we have to do is calculate the percentage change in EBIT in EPS, and then divide that by the percentage change in EBIT. Or if we want to view it a different way, we can just take the change in EPS from one period to another and divide that, that, do that dollar value change in EPS by the old EPS and then divide all of that by the change in EBIT divided by original EBIT. Now we can also rearrange this formula to get e EBIT divided by EBIT minus I. And I is going to be the interest expense in a given period. So both of these formulas are really, uh, all three of these formulas are going to give us our degree of financial leverage. Let's take a look at an example. All right, so Ford's forecasted EBIT is $750,000. This year, Ford will pay $250,000 in interest on its debt and $320,000 in dividends to its common shareholders. If its marginal tax rate is 40%, what is Ford's DFL? Now, hint, hint. We won't need some of this information. All right, so we know our EBIT of 70, 750000 and we know our interest expense of 250000 That's our I from that previous equation. 
All we have to do to get our degree of financial leverage is just take EBIT divided by the quantity of EBIT minus interest. And thus we get 750,000 750, divided by 750,000 minus 250,000, or to put it another way, 1.5. Now, what this tells us is that if there is a 1% change in EBIT, we would expect a 1.5% change in earnings per share. The final measure of leverage we have is the degree of total leverage. This metric measures the percentage change in EPS that results from a given percentage change in sales. The degree of total leverage, or DTL, shows the effects of both operating leverage and financial leverage. We measure the DTL by one of two ways. We can either just take the formula for the degree of operating leverage and multiply it by the components of the degree of financial leverage. So say, for example, we have gross profit divided by EBIT and multiply that by EBIT divided by EBIT minus interest expense. Or we could do something that's a little easier and just multiply our degree of operating leverage by our degree of financial leverage. Let's take a look at an example. So Sony expects this year's sales to be $560,000. Their variable operating costs are 75% of sales and fixed operating costs are $90,000. Sony pays interest on its debt equal to $30,000 a year and its marginal tax rate is 35%. What is the firm's degree of total leverage? All right, so there's really a couple of different ways to do this, but the easiest way is to break this down into three steps. First, we'll solve for the degree of operating leverage then we'll solve for the degree of financial leverage. And then finally, I'll multiply the DOL by the DFL and we'll get our DTL, which is what we're after here. Now, I guess I could do this on a financial calculator, but sometimes it's just easier to see what I'm doing by me doing it in Excel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to Excel and work this problem. All right, so here we go. So here's our problem, and just to make things easier for you, I listed all of the formulas that we might need over here on the left-hand side. And what we're going to do is we're going to get the DOL, then the DFL, then the DTL. All right, so in this first part, step one, we'll get our DOL. And to do this, we're going to use the one part of the DOL formula that we haven't used yet. Uh, we're going to use this part that says our total year's sales minus our variable operating costs, that quantity divided by total sales minus variable operating costs minus fixed costs will give us our DOL. So in this case, we'll have our year's sales of 560,000 minus, well, we know that operating costs are 75% of sales. So what we can do is take 560, 560,000 and multiply that by 0.75 and that'll give us our total variable costs and I'll close my parentheses and that'll give us our numerator for this formula. Next, I'm going to divide by again our sales minus total variable costs minus fixed costs. So 560,000 minus that 560,000 times 0.75 and then minus our fixed costs. And our fixed operating costs are given here as 90,000. So 90,000. And close parentheses, and there we go. Our degree of financial, of operating leverage is 2.8. Next, let's get our degree of financial leverage. And so just like DOL, I have a couple of formulas I can use. And really depending on what information you have, the way you calculate it is going to be slightly different, but I know that we have our interest expense, and I know that we also have our EBIT. Our EBIT is just going to be our sales minus all of our costs. So here it'd be essentially the denominator of our original DOL formula. It's just total sales minus variable costs minus fixed costs. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our sales minus variable costs minus fixed cost and use that as our EBIT. And then 
I'm going to plug in our $30,000 interest on our debt as our interest expense, and that'll give us our degree of financial leverage. So let's get started. So here we have 560,000 minus 560 times 0.75 minus $90,000 in fixed costs. And we're going to divide that entire thing by the quantity of 560,000 and make sure that you add enough zeros minus quantity of 560,000 times 0.75 and subtract out $90,000. Close your parentheses and then subtract out your interest expense, which is 30,000. And that'll get us there. And so our degree of financial leverage is 2.5. So that's it. Now we can use this last formula to calculate our degree of total leverage. And when I do that, aka when I take 2.8 times 2.5, I get a degree of total leverage of 7. And we're done. So what this answer of 7 tells us if is if there's a 1% change in total sales, we can expect a 7% change in earnings per share. The higher that number is, potentially the better, but it, it does indicate that this firm is more risky than competitors that, let's say, have a, a degree of total leverage of, let's say, 4. All right, so now I'm going to flip back over to our lecture. Now that we've discussed how to measure leverage and how capital structure affects earnings per share, it's time to introduce our last formula. Now, throughout both, throughout both parts of this lecture, I've mentioned that as firms use more financial leverage, they become less likely to be able to cover the costs of that leverage. There is a specific ratio that allows us to determine how many times over a firm can cover its interest expenses on its debt. That ratio is called the times interest earned, or tie ratio. We simply take the EBIT of our firm and divide it by the interest expenses of that firm. And obviously I have the that formula right here. Now obviously we don't want a tie ratio that's too low. Usually this means a tie ratio below about 4. However, a tie ratio of 15 to 20 indicates that our firm could issue new debt and lever up, and thus increase its earnings per share. Therefore, there's actually kind of a happy medium that we like to see, and that happy medium is usually tie ratios between about 7 to 12. Now, the final topic I'll discuss is the use of financial leverage overseas. The amount of financial leverage around the world varies dramatically. In countries like Japan, Italy, and Germany, the average debt to total assets ratio is usually between 65% to 85% to 80%, while in the US that number is typically between 45% and 60%, depending on the time period. Researchers have spent decades analyzing why there's such a large disparity in the amount of leverage across countries. And there are a couple of possibilities, like differences in the tax rates, uh, differences in the value of the tax shield, the differences in creditor or shareholder rights, for example. However, some of these hypotheses really don't hold up. For example, we know that although there is no capital gains tax in some countries where firms ha are heavily indebted, those firms are not incentivized to issue more equity, which would be obviously beneficial to sh shareholders thanks to a larger after-tax return on their investment. There are other theories out there to explain the difference in the use of debt around the world. For example, in some countries, creditors are more likely to issue bank loans than buy corporate bonds issued by a firm. In Germany, for example, it's common for a bank to lend money directly to a firm via a revolving bank loan, otherwise known as a revolver, and then also take an equity stake in the firm to ensure the management of the firm is not acting in an inappropriate manner. In other words, the bank takes an equity stake to try and reduce the agency costs of issuing debt to that firm.
The bank has more leverage to fire the CEO if it takes an equity stake as well as a debt stake in the firm, and it can also play a larger role in the bankruptcy process should bankruptcy occur. All right, so let's summarize what we just covered. We introduced many of the popular theories that predict capital structure like agency theory, market timing, and signaling theory. And there's at least some evidence for each of these theories in the real world, which suggests that there are many explanations for the amount of leverage that firms use. And firms are not basing their, their leverage decision all on the same crap factor. Next, I introduced the formulas for DOL, DFL, and DTL, and I showed you why they're important. I also introduced the tie ratio, which allows us to determine the number of times our firm can cover interest expenses using EBIT. Finally, I discussed leverage around the world and the fact that variations in leverage across countries is likely due to differences in the relationship between lenders and borrowers. So that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me, and I look forward to hearing from you.